The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. They're not your children. They belong to the Father. You're just designated to raise those children, to be a caretaker of those children to a certain point when they're not yours. They're not your children. They are indeed your fellow man. They are. If they're not your children, they're your fellow man. Yet, forgive me, because I see life in a very different way. The truth of life is not on the outside, not by DNA and all these things. That's by flesh. But I tend to see life by the Spirit. The only thing that has life to me are those things of the Spirit. Because that's what our Father teaches us. That everything in the flesh, these things the flesh, they serve their purpose. But indeed, they're spiritually dead. And so the only thing that has true life, which has eternal life, those things that will exist and keep continue to exist are those things of the Spirit. So then, true life for a saint would be those things, the spirit, not the flesh. That's why we don't live by the flesh, or walk by the flesh, but we live by the spirit and walk by the spirit. Anyway, those children, God gave them spirits that are not passed down by way of DNA, so they don't belong to you. You were a container that gave to them the traits that they have and everything else, therefore you can take care of them. But you know why they came from you? This is so funny. This may just totally mess up your brains, but they were born from you so you would have the ability, because they picked up your traits, your dispositions, and all this, that, and the other. For those of you who, who have had children born of you, they have your traits and everything so that you can properly take care of them. For example, if you see a strange child and they have a look on their face, you may not know what that look is, but their mother does. Why? Because that baby came from that mother. Right? The mother knows the look on her own face. Therefore, she can also discern the look on the baby's face. A mother can tell a lot about that child because they share a bond, a very deep bond. So they can tell the looks on the faces, thus doing what? Caring for that child better than a stranger would. So they're born from you so that you have an ability to recognize their needs. And you can raise them. You can see through things. When they state one thing, you can look in their eyes and see something totally different. So you can better take care of them. Just to give that explanation. But you're still a caretaker, designated caretaker of those children. But indeed, their spirits come from the Father. If they come from the Father, spirits come from the Father. So in that case, they're fellow man. They're your brothers and sisters, spiritually. They're not your children. They don't belong to you. You don't own them. They belong to the Father. You're designated to take care of them. They were born of you that you may take care of them a little better than the average person would. So that you have an intimate connection knowing and you can look right through certain things like their cries and their tears and their their tantrums. You can look right through that and see the heart of the problem. Now, if you have an adopted child, you already have help to raise that child. The father can make that connection with you with that child should he purpose that child to be with you. And so still in that case, they don't belong to you. So what you're doing is you're helping to raise a future generation is what you're doing. But still, you don't want that child to go through those things you do. Now, because they come from you and because they're children, naturally you want to save them from everything that is on purpose too. That's on purpose too. So you love them. You have an idea that they're yours, that they're your responsibility on a very deep level. And so you would actually begin to die for them with no problem, right? That's why they come from you. Now, each and every one of us who have children, we would do that for our own children, right? Which, that's not a bad thing. But it does reveal some hypocrisy in us anyway. Let me continue. But they don't belong to us. So we had to establish the fact that the children belong to the Lord. And we are the caretakers of those kids for a specific amount of time. But we have gone through things that we don't want them to go through. And sometimes you can see the same things in them that we had in us. And thus you know what they're dealing with. But you're trying to save them from that problem. The problem is you may be in the hole yourself. Now when you're in the hole yourself, that hole is a place that you want to be delivered from. You don't want to stay there for the rest of your days. In other words, you're trying to walk forward. You don't want to stay in that place. You're stuck in this place. You're, and you have tried everything to get out of this hole, this place in life, this circumstance, this nagging situation. Every single last person on the face of the earth has a situation they want out of. And guess what? They've tried everything to get out of it. And it didn't work. That's why they're still in it. Before I disclose any further in that conversation, the child portion of this conversation is a good example of just who we are, and let me show you how, real quick. We want to save that child from everything because we understand the pain you have to go through in growth, and we want to spare them from going through certain pains that we did. So we kind of teach them to be more inclined 
to moral things. We try to tell them that, hey, it's going to pay off, but you just have to maintain it. Don't we do that? Because the child says, I don't see how this is doing any good. And you tell the child, what do you tell the child? You just hang on, keep doing it. It will pay off soon. Don't you say that? Don't you convey that the best way you can to tell them to hang on, to hold on, to keep the moral away. It will pay off soon. Don't drift to the left. Don't drift to the right. Those places hurt. Just keep going straight. You do everything in your power, don't you? So I'm going to ask you this. If you have a heart to save your kids from what you know they're going to go through because you can see their attitudes and everything else, how come you can't do it so well? Well, let me tell you this, the father knows exactly who they are. So what you can't do, he steps in. Here it is. If you have no power to change a situation, that situation is not yours. Your father steps in. So the father did step in. How did he step in? Well, see, your father breaks the flesh. See, if the flesh is broken, and once it's broken enough, it dies. Once the flesh is dead, the spirit is alive. He's giving your children life by breaking them. This is a process we don't understand because we go through these hardships and we think they're the worst thing in the world. But we, what we really haven't looked at is this. All the things that happen to you in your life only happen against your flesh. It did not happen against your spirit. You were given a newness of spirit by the Lord, right? It's being raised. It has life. But your flesh had life too. In other words, you were living your life by way of the flesh, by what you felt, by what you desired and all these things. You were living your life by the flesh and the Father's killing He's destroying your flesh that you may be spiritually alive. Because you can't be spiritually alive when your flesh is leading your life. Can't do that. So the same process he put through, it put us through. And those things we contended with, here's what you did. You had a heart understanding what you went through. Now that you know the Lord, you don't want your children to go through it. So the Lord began the work, but you didn't understand the work. You saw a bunch of cruelty and everything else upon your child because you interpret what happened in your life as cruelty. What you don't know is that he's breaking the flesh. Many of you were born with broken flesh. Many of you went through things in your youth that broke your flesh and it really got to your mind. But what you didn't know is that the Lord gave you a born-again spirit which is not touched by anything of flesh. So he's breaking your flesh and breaking your children's flesh. That's why you have no power to intervene. What we often don't consider is that for each and every one of us, there's a time, a truthful time in our lives. And let me tell you what I mean. A lot of people say, well, I'm, you know, this person needs to wake up and they need to see the Lord. Let me, let me explain this to you. Would God send his son and not have every single human being have their moment with the Lord where first this person knew, in fact, it was Jesus. They had knowledge of that. Where a person knew, in fact, he died on the cross. They had knowledge of that too. Where a person knew, in fact, he died for their sins. In other words, there's a moment when the Lord gives that to a person. They have this moment in time where they know the absolute truth. And in that moment where they know the absolute truth, they make a decision. They make a truthful decision to accept it or not. See, God does, he's not a trickster. You guys hear me say this all the time, which means he does not influence a person to follow something. He hasn't given a person the truth for. He gives us the truth about Christ. We all had our moments where we were knocked in the head and we said, oh my goodness, he died on the cross. See, but everybody told us he died on the cross. No, that's not what I'm talking about. We had that moment where it hit us, where we really understood he died on the cross to save us of our sins. That's that moment when we remembered how filthy we actually were. And in that moment, we made a choice. That's the moment I'm speaking of. So then everybody has that moment, even your children, no matter how bad they are, no matter if they're locked up, no matter if they're half dead, they're going to have their moment before they leave this earth. So what is the Lord doing? By breaking the flesh, you become aware of your own deeds, of your own sin, of your own everything. Did you know that? You didn't, did you? By destroying your flesh, enough of the spirit will be alive for a person to have that moment. If they choose Christ, he will further destroy things of the flesh. We have to remember Jesus will present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. What he began, he's going to finish. So with your children, he began this moment first. We just didn't understand what he was doing because we don't understand that he broke our flesh too. I look at people who have been molested when they were young. Right? Now, in most cases, I've worked in a lot of cases where people have been molested and raped and things like that when they were young. They don't understand why that happened to them. And what normally happens to a person who's been molested when they were young by a family member they trusted is they don't really, in their hearts, they don't really believe Jesus will save them or he will keep them from another horrible situation like that. So they have an absolute mistrust of God saving them. So they go through life with a dilemma where they really think they have to protect themselves. They really believe that they have to protect themselves because in their minds they believe that God didn't show up for them. This is how they believe. 
Those are the special cases which are drawn to me for some reason. And I like to tell people, you know, it's those cases that I deal with so much because I have a passion for that. For those who have been broken when they were young, I have a passion for that. Who knew? But I do. I have great passion for that because the Lord gave me understanding of it. Because he broke your flesh early. The breaking of the flesh is not a kind act. It's not. It's a very violent act. Suppose to break your flesh, you went out there and got hooked on drugs. You ruined your flesh. I mean, just ruined it. And you caught a disease. You ruined your flesh. He broke your flesh. All of a sudden, because your flesh is no good, the desires of your flesh begin to fall away. You don't desire the same things because you cannot obtain them. You're broken. You're cut off from those things. Well, you're going to have to fill your time with something. And so in most cases, a person like that will begin to realize what happened. And they'll say, Lord, I need you. They will know that they need the Lord. Well, in doing that, at first, they begin to follow the Lord out of a type of death despotism, realizing what they did to their flesh is the only course they have in life. But what they don't understand is as they continue to go forward with the Lord, they're strengthened spiritually to the point where they're not following him because he's the last, last choice. But it becomes the first choice. He becomes first and foremost in their life. At that point, they don't care. They understand what they did to the flesh, but they want to kill off the rest of their flesh. And they begin to see the air of their desires of flesh. Then they see the flesh for what it really is. And they say, oh my God, the flesh is filthy. It desires corruption and more corruption. It is greedy. It can never be fulfilled. It's not a good thing. Thank you, Lord, for destroying my flesh. And in that case, that trauma they once saw in their life, they see as God saving them. When a person sees the truth, we're all going to come to the same conclusion. The Father was saving us, not killing us. He saves us from ourselves. Can you imagine all that stuff we went through? And I, and I went ahead in the conversation. I'm telling you guys about that part, but I'm telling you, this part is here in the chat room. There's so many things in life. And that's why we don't want our children to go through it. Because we knew if we had a mind to make the better choices and decisions, we would have. But we didn't have the heart. We were desirous of corrupt things. And we know this. We can admit this. But we don't want our children being desirous of corrupt things. So how do you change that in a child? Well, first you realize that for yourself. You say, yes, I did desire corrupt things. I did not walk in a godly light. And... That's just the way it was. And then you find out your parents didn't either. Then you realize, wait a minute, I don't want my children doing this. So you try to start saving them from that trouble. But the reality is you can't. But the Lord does. He breaks their flesh. You see them in this bad state where you're grieving in the heart, not understanding that the Lord is breaking. For everything you lost in, he's breaking from them. He's breaking them early. Listen, most of you guys, you may not know this, but most of the folks that have been raped or abused when they were young. Did you ever look to see what your parents were like? Did you notice that you were not covered? You had no spiritual cover. Did you notice that what they were like? Because somebody wasn't doing right. Now surely when, when that happened to you, guess what happened? Guess what you did when you had kids? You said that's not going to happen to them. Why did you say that? See as a result of that, you were disgusted by lust. Though you still practice lust and you still may have to fight with lust from time to time. You were disgusted by it, so much so that you covered your children by way of the Lord from it. It was not passed down to them. Now for your children, it's disconnected. Unless you fell asleep, it's disconnected. They know nothing about what you know. Because you're the parent now, and you didn't betray them. You didn't betray them because a generational curse was broken with you, and it didn't pass down to them. So instead of cursing your life that some bad thing happened, you ought to be thankful that you were the roadblock for that curse. You were. God stopped the curse with you for the sake of your children. That's a good thing. Many people don't know this. There are a multitude of different scenarios. This is just one, and in each and every case, it's a good thing. And people end up seeing the good thing. This is just one out of many. One-on-one, -on -one, I can explain to each person what the Lord has given to me. One-on-one, -on -one, but the curse stopped with you. Now, if that was that curse, but there are things that we contend with that we lost in, and we know it. God is breaking that from your children. That's a good thing. See those generational curses of old where people had to pay for the sins of the parents and this and the other, or just even a curse in general. All that's been done away with. Every single last bit of it has. Each individual is on an equal plane. Generational curses are broken. Thank you, Lord. I don't mind being used to break a generational curse. I don't mind that. If my whole life was suffering, so what? My kids won't suffer. Do you understand? And it really reveals that level of love we really have for children. See, in truth, I don't suffer because they're alive, because it's not carried on. 
Even if they're not alive anymore, it was still broken. So it's a good thing. It won't enter into the earth. It stops with me. How about that? See, through Adam, sin came into the world. Through Christ, it's being destroyed. Hallelujah. Do you really mind being used as a vessel of the Most High to destroy things in the earth that were destroying the earth itself? Surely you wouldn't mind if you understood, but most people don't have understanding of these things, do they? It's very difficult to think in these terms because we're used to using what? The carnal mind, that natural mind, your mind of logic, but you're spiritual. You're not to use a carnal mind, but a spiritual mind which understands the truth, not the logistics. The Lord is working with you and he's working with your children. Now, a lot of parents get a little upset because they, they say, well, they're in distress. They don't know if their kids are going to be delivered or what. And so I asked a question. I said, has God forgotten about your children? People start saying, well, no, never. You'll never forget about the kids. Or do you think God will just abandon your children? Well, no, never. And why are you worried about your children? He's taking them through that process also. What do you think of the Bible? It was often echoed about his strange work. In other words, if it's strange, that means you don't have an answer for it. That means what God is doing may look one way, but the outcome is going to be beautiful. You just don't know it yet because it will never look like that. Remember, those are God's children. And you know what the beauty of it is? You can't mess it up for them because you believe in Christ. See, you can't help but to believe in Christ because God decreed to break that curse before you even came. You are the vessel he utilized to break the curse. You were coming anyway. One way or the other, you were coming. You were already decreed to come from the foundation of the world to break a curse that was not in existence yet. Isn't that an awesome thing? So you, in fact, were always going to come. Isn't that awesome? You were always going to be sent here to this earth to break that curse and to do much, much more. You just didn't know. See, we think in this concept of humanity is centric to everything else. That's not true. Like we're the center of everything. We are not the center of everything. We don't even know why we're here. In the world, people search and try to find out why do we exist and all this, that, and the other. God has already told us. We just don't listen always. It's in the King James Version of the Bible. And while men are occupied to read the Bible for the sake of internal power and power upon themselves, I tend to read it to find out and discover who my father is and what's going on with me. I'm unclean. I don't desire to be unclean. So I read the word to find out what the Father has said. Where are my instructions on how to be clean? I never enforce what I learn upon the, in the word of God upon anyone else because everything is by choice and everything is by way of love, which is the real power in this earth that's more powerful than anything in the earth. Do you know that? It is only by love that matter is held together. That's called the will of God. God's will is love, and so matter is held together because he desires it to. We still exist because of his love. That's a power that a bomb cannot even break in that awesome. It is the strongest, strongest force anyone could ever know is love. It is the reason for existence itself. It is the reason why things have maintained themselves for so long. It is love. It's nothing else. Why do you think it is stated that God is love? It's because people of today don't understand what love is because we're so steeped in science giving explanation as to the various components of love itself. So we don't understand our own lives, but there's a purpose to your life far beyond which you have captured by your carnal mind. And again, there's no puzzle to put together. There is only the truth. The truth is not a puzzle because it's not fragmented. The truth is whole. We either have it or we don't. It's in you, but it must be confirmed by your reading of the Word of God. So that when you read the Word of God, you begin to eat it. Now, if you're reading the Word of God to fight somebody else, you're messing up. If you're reading the Word of God to save your skin, you're messing up. If you're reading the Word of God for your purpose, you're messing up. Read the Word of God to know who your Father is and what He requires of you and you only. Don't read it for the sake of somebody else. Don't read it to prove anybody wrong. That's an evil word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When you go out there and prove somebody wrong, that's a type of vengeance. It's very simple, isn't it? Now, back to the conversation about the whole. Many of us are in that hole. Just about everybody's in the hole, or they would want to stay where they are for the rest of their lives. How do you get out of that hole? You've tried for all these years to get out the hole. You've not gotten out yet. What does that mean? I didn't get around to this, but what does that mean? Because you've tried everything you know how to do. The truth is you've proven to yourself that you can't get out the hole. Now, I'm going to mention something to you in the Old Testament. They know God by many different names. One of them is Deliverer. I told you guys in the chat room that David often referred to God as the deliverer. Why? Because David was in many holes also. David tried to deliver himself on a few occasions only to find himself deeper. He had no solution. And so he began to call God his deliverer. Why? Because only God can raise you out of the hole. But first he proves to you that you can't deliver yourself. And that's exactly what he did. Because you guys began to admit, I can't get out of the hole. I did everything I know how to do. 
I've been praying I can't get out of the hole. That's right, because you're not going to deliver yourself. If God's going to be known as your deliverer and have that attribute in your life, then you're not going to deliver yourself. He won't allow that. Isn't that simple? Why would God allow you to deliver yourself if he is going to be known as your deliverer? So let me give you this hint. All those names that you see in the Bible are the attributes you're going to know God by. After you know them all, then you're going to know him. Until you know those attributes of his name, you do not know him. And if you don't know him as your deliverer, which many of you may not, you know him as Savior, you know him as Adonai, you know him as Lord, but you don't know him as deliverer. But you will once he delivers you. See, once he delivers you, you will never ever say, well, it was this, or well, it was that, or well, it could have been this, and it could have been that. Nope, that's not what you're going to say. You're not even going to say, well, it's because I said this prayer, and this prayer, and this prayer. Nope, you're not going to say that either. It won't be because of your prayers. It's not going to be because of what you did. It's going to be because God is deliverer. So all I did was prove you wrong that you're not going to deliver yourself. What is he doing? Name by name, he's introducing himself to you. All throughout your life, he does this. That is his process. Listen, just like grace and mercy is upon you, you did not earn it, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be saved. I know what I did in life. I don't deserve to be saved from my slate to be wiped clean. I deserve all the ridicule, all the rebuke, and everything else a person can muster. That's what I deserve. I certainly don't deserve to be saved. But see, I know Jesus as my Savior. Why? Because I did nothing for it. That's why. See, when you know the Savior, when you know the Lord, or you know your Father in heaven, you're also going to know you did nothing to know him by that name. You did not earn it. You didn't work for it. It wasn't your deeds or anything else. But in that, he gave it to you by way of love. That's how you're going to know him. Because if God is love, you will know him by his love. Not by wages, but by love. And if you're going to know him by love, then everything he grants to you is going to be given to you when you don't deserve it. Now you're beginning to understand if you can capture exactly what I said, because that is your father. You're not going to deliver yourself. You're not going to heal yourself. That's why most of the healings that people try to get from these doctors and everything else, something else happens. If they get rid of the cancer, they have something else. If they get rid of the something else, something else comes back. But the moment the person says, I don't deserve the healing or anything else, then that's the opportunity for them to really know the father as their healer, because he is love. You're not going to earn what you get from him. That's why so many people fail. But it's also why I'm free. Thank you, Lord. I am free, free, free. I saw a turbo tax commercial where God gets up in court and he said, for free, for free, free, for free, free, free. That is my salvation. Free. It's free. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Because it's my way of God's love. His love bestowed upon me requires nothing of me. And I accept it. Thank you, Lord. I'll walk in it. I'll embrace it every day and it means something to me. See, when you know you don't deserve something, when you know for a fact you don't deserve it, that's when you can receive it. When you really know you don't deserve it, then you're facing the truth. Now you're within the realm of truth. See, if you think you deserve it, you're not in the realm of truth. You're still in the delusion. But when you know you don't deserve it, when you're well acquainted with who you are and what you did, when we stop justifying ourselves and our actions and everything else, we understand that we are scumballs, aren't we? But God calls us his precious children. That's enough to break your heart 50,000 pieces in a good way. Because you begin to ponder, why does he love me so much? And you can help but to instantly say, you are my father indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, he's doing the same thing to your kids. See, he's raising you and your children. That's what he's doing. Even if your children are grown, he's still raising them. He's not done with them because he's not done with you. And indeed, he's raising all of us. So how do you get out of the hole having exhausted everything you know how to do? You're not, but he will. He's going to raise you up. He already said that. What do you do in the meantime? Ah, that warrants an, a complete discussion. See, everybody will tell you to wait upon the Lord, but they don't tell you the other instruction. What do you do while you're waiting? They don't tell you that. What do you do while you're waiting? I'll give you one thing so I don't leave you hanging. When you're waiting, you're powerless to change this situation, that situation. I want you to take a look at your situation. Number one, realize what it is. Now, in the middle of that situation, I want you to execute the word of God according to love, according to truth, and according to your very soul. In other words, begin to walk in faith with the Lord. That means conduct yourself as a child of the living God, maintaining the standards of your Father that He has given to you that you know. that You can't maintain a standard you're not familiar with, but what you are familiar with, begin to live by it. For example, if the Lord had me in a place where I didn't have a dime, 
I mean, everything was strained and everything was going down the tubes. Well, everything is going down the tubes. I am to pick myself up in the Lord. I am to conduct myself, continue to do what I'm doing right now. Listen, right now, I do what I do to continue to do that, to do it wholeheartedly, to begin to, when I interact with people, do so as an ambassador to Christ representing the kingdom. Something happens when you live your life as a child of the living God, having given it over to Christ while you're in your circumstances, something powerful happens. It is so powerful. You may want to, after you're delivered, you may want to go right back to that hole because that's where the work is. See, the work is not outside the hole. The work is inside the hole. Most people don't know that. They say, get me out of the hole, then I'll go to work. Uh-uh. The hole is a proving ground. In other words, if we say we have faith, then you should know this right now. Everything you say you have is going to be tried. The hole is purposed or you wouldn't be in the hole. In that hole, you are to get up right now in your ambassadorship, in your walk, and conduct your life right now in your circumstances like a child of the living God should, what he has given to you. So you don't wait till anything comes or anything is broken or anything is healed. Right now, where you are, get up and begin to conduct your life as an ambassador. And the miracles will begin. You haven't done that. See, that's the one thing you didn't even know to do. Once you begin to conduct yourself, something is going to change in you because God said it would and indeed it will. See, when bondage leaves, when you're in the middle of your circumstances, that's just totally weird. That's what that is. You'll go from one day of looking at your circumstances where you can barely eat a meal to the next day you're totally free. And you're looking around saying, this is can't be happening. Everything in you would have changed. Begin the process right away. You're not to sit there and wait and do nothing. No, you're not to sit there and beg either. God doesn't want you begging. Haven't we learned that by now? We don't have to beg. If we were to beg, he would not say, go boldly to the throne of grace. We are not to beg. We have direct access. But what you are to do is to stand up right now where you are in your circumstances while everything is wrong and say, yes, Lord. And you continue to do that. Listen, because if you can do that in the worst of your circumstances, you have truly chosen the Lord. But if you can't do that in the worst of your circumstances, then what you really have chosen is the Lord to make you free so you can do what you want to do. You're being tested right now. You're in a crucible. You're under a hot fire because everything of God is tried by fire. Whatever survives in the end truly belonged to God. Whatever is destroyed was nothing of your father. Because when God sends a fire, it never burns him. So anything of him in you will never be burned. So the only thing that's going to survive that fire has to be of God or it's going to be consumed. Stand up where you are. Why do you think it hasn't left yet? This is not punishment. This is your chance to open that door wide open and to walk right through. This is your deliverance. In the middle of your circumstances, found deliverance, not outside. You're thinking about getting out of the hole, but you need healing also. You need repair. You need heart surgery. You need mind surgery, don't you? Your family needs surgery. Your children need surgery. Your situation needs surgery. Deliverance is more than getting you out of the hole. It is a reversal of everything. Would you rather get out of the hole and still take your chances? to be delivered because God's deliverance is total deliverance. God never halfway delivers. If God ever delivers you, everything is fixed. Did you notice that when he healed a person, you know what he said? Go and sin no more. Why did he say that? Because he wiped away every sin in them before they even knew it. Because he made them whole again. He restored them again. They leaped and jumped all over the place because they weren't winos anymore, sulking in the problems. They were free of everything. That's God's deliverance. That's his deliverance. And if you're in that hole, you're scheduled to be delivered. You're scheduled to be delivered. Do you understand? You're in that hole for a reason. You thought that getting out of the hole, then you could find your way to get healed of this and get free of this. Uh-uh. You're scheduled. You're in the waiting area. The physician is calling you for absolute and total surgery. That is to say deliverance. Get up and operate now as a child of the living God by faith in Christ. Do it now. Don't wait for anything. Do it now. And watch the hand of God. God always says, try me. That's what he keeps saying. Try me. The Lord is saying, do what I instructed you to do. Do what I've given you. You see, he doesn't require us to do what he hasn't given us. He requires us to do what he's given us. He's not going to say, come down the hallway and you don't know which way to turn. He'll never say that. But if he says, come down the hallway, you are to take the direction you're already familiar with. But he already put in you. He does not call you into strangeness. He calls you into truth. Whatever he's given you already, whatever you know already is sufficient. You start there. You are equipped to stand up right now. But who's going to try it? 
who will endeavor to devote their time to it, their life to it, and stand up right now and begin to walk by faith. Because those who stand up by faith and begin to conduct themselves while they're waiting, they will be pleasing unto the Lord. Blessed is that person who is pleasing unto the Lord. And you're not scheduled for some phony deliverance from mankind. You're scheduled to be delivered by the power and authority of the living God. And we know that comes by way of Christ. See, we didn't get to that part yet. That Now, everybody here listening to me, those of you who began this conversation with me, that would have taken a long time to write and indeed explain. That has nothing to do with doctrine. That's not some mojo bojo stuff either. That's our Father. That's His way. But you are the recipients, the chosen vessels of His deliverance. Or you would not be in that problem. You would not be in that hole. Stand up where you are with what you have, with what He equipped you with, and utilize it. Utilize what He's already given you. You cannot utilize what He did not give you. Stand up. In the middle of that waiting, that's when you stand up and go to work. And by faith, when you go to work, you're doing things as though they are, but they're not. He will lead you and guide you at that point. See, when you're in your situation like that, you stand up. When all odds are against you and everything has fallen apart, you really have no, you have no reason to stand on your own. You have no will to stand on your own. If you do stand up, you're doing so purely out of faith. See, that's when the windows of heaven open up. In truth, not to pour out some money, but a wholeness you've never had before. One thing I know about deliverance, when God delivers you, you will never mistake his deliverance again. Nor will you ever doubt being delivered again. But if you've not been delivered by God, you don't know his deliverance. And so you begin to worry. See, if God delivers you, you'll know he will deliver and you will not worry about the deliverance of anybody. Once you're familiar with his deliverance, you're not going to sit there and worry about your children being delivered. You'll walk differently, think differently, process things differently. But one thing you will know is his deliverance. You will also know wholeness. And you're scheduled to be delivered. And I'm not telling you something I read. I know God's deliverance. But I don't worry about certain things. There's some areas I don't know his name by. Nor can I ever say I can, but he'll take me in those areas. Name by name, you are to know him. And he will introduce himself to you. And every time he does it, it blows you away. And it does not matter how old you are, how much you rejected him. If you're in that hole, your purpose to be in that hole, because you're in that hole with the belief of Christ inside of you. You're truly called. Again, when God delivers you, you'll never mistake, nor will you ever doubt. He will deliver you again. You'll never doubt it. And when you don't doubt his deliverance, you won't doubt it upon yourself or another either. You'll never doubt that he will deliver your children. Therefore, you will not worry about them in certain aspects. See, if I were to worry about my children, it's not because of their deliverance. I know the Lord's going to bring them through everything. I know this. If I were to worry about my children, it would probably be, did I pick out the right colors for them? It's because I don't know what to give them. But it has nothing to do with them being delivered. I know for a fact, no matter how it looks, God will deliver them. I know that. They're also going to have their moment. I know that. The last point I was going to make is something that demonstrates who we are right now. When we look at our children... And we favor them over every other child, knowing that spiritually they're not our children, but that they are our fellow servants, brothers and sisters. We practice favoritism too much, which also causes wars among us. That is a human condition that we are not to operate by. In other words, if I care and worry about my children, but I disregard your children, I can't even see the truth about the children. Because let me share this, when you see the truth about the children, all children become as though they're your children. You'll never favor one over the other again. Which means you won't just, if you did worry, you won't worry about one, you'll worry about all of them. And once you see children that way, you're going to see your fellow man that way. You're God's children. You're worth the world. And you're the reason I'm here. I don't make a distinction by way of flesh of what you have done and what you have not done, how much you like me, how much you dislike me. My worst enemy is still yet a child of the living God, and I am in debt to them with a debt of love. Once you walk in the Spirit, you discard seeing things by flesh. Thus you walk by way of truth, not by error. Offenses come because of an error, is what the Bible says. The error is seen by way of the flesh. Jesus said, you judge by what you see, I judge no man. That's what Jesus said. You're judging by the actions of another person. Jesus says, I judge no man. Why did he say, I judge no man? Because he can see the truth of all of us. He knows the spirit that dwells in man. He can see the truth of all of us. And it looks beyond the flesh. When you look at the flesh, you're going to be tossed to and fro on a daily basis emotionally. Thus, you'll be led by your emotions. 
and not by the Spirit. When you see the Spirit of another man, which no man can see, but God intended all of his children to see, you won't differ. You understand that the flesh has foul deeds, and you tend to assist and help people rather than hurt them. Most importantly, if you become an ambassador to Christ, the Spirit of the Lord is going to be with you everywhere you go. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It will be a chain breaker all throughout the earth. And indeed, that is your destiny. You won't stay in that hole. God will deliver you. But spiritually, contemplating these topics is nothing like the carnal mind, is it? Nothing like the carnal mind. And you know what? You can't even read about this stuff either. These things are given to you. These things are revealed to you. They can be seen, yes, but only for those who are looking. And you cannot look for yourself either. If you look for yourself, you won't see them. You normally see them when you seek to know the Lord your God. Because then you begin to trust Him with all of what you want. Thank you. I do. I thank the Lord for these talks.